What's up people, Sidorus here with Jazz Economics. About two weeks ago there was an Oxford style debate carried out at the Soho Forum on the topic of socialism versus capitalism. Check this out. The resolution is socialism is more effective than capitalism in bringing freedom to the masses. In favor of this resolution we have Bhaskar Sunkara and arguing against this resolution we have Jean Epstein the full video is available on YouTube, and I'll post a link in the video description for anyone who wants to go check it out. It's about an hour and 45 minutes, so in this video I'm going to be doing highlights, a breakdown of each debater's arguments, and offering my opinion to both sides of the debate. We do have freedom today. We're not living in the worst of all possible worlds, but it's an unnecessarily limited freedom. It's a freedom mostly enjoyed by those who own capitalist private property. The rest of us are at the mercy of those people. Business owners get to impose working conditions that if given a good alternative, most people would reject. And while workers do most of the work at a job, owners have unilateral say over how profits are divided. These are contracts that are made under duress. They're contracts that undemocratically give some people tremendous power over others. Throughout this video, you'll hear Bhaskar refer to capitalism as a form of exploitation and uh, even analogous to slavery several times. This is fundamentally a Marxist position, and I've already done a video talking about whether or not capitalism is voluntary, and I would really like to hear what Bhaskar would say about the points that I laid out in that video, because he doesn't do it during the debate. And Epstein doesn't press him on it. If I were in this debate, I would be pressing him really hard to prove that it is a form of exploitation. We could see existing societies take Europe's welfare states, uh, in most cases built by social democratic uh, uh, movements, uh, where private property has been undermined through the regulation of capital. Um, in those societies, the majority enjoy a greater range of, range of choice, and they have a greater chance to reach their God-given potential than they do in the United States before. If I own a factory and I employ Gene, uh, there's a restriction on my freedom to use the machinery that I purchased with any given set of, of workers, including Gene, uh, for more than 40 hours a week. That, there's a restriction on my ability to unilaterally dismiss Gene. If Gene isn't doing a good job and within the first hour of a screw-up, I want to dismiss him and so forth. So I find this pretty ironic because here he's talking about taking away freedoms from entrepreneurs and business owners. Remember, the resolution here is which system provides the most freedom. Socialism is not so much about trading freedom for equality, but rather posing the question of freedom for whom. Bhaskar says that this is not a trade of freedom for security, but then listen to what he says here. Um, but for the majority of people who don't own private property, for people like Gene, they enjoy a greater uh, range of choice in deciding their life outcomes, uh, deciding the conditions in which they live every day, and a greater chance to reach their full potential. They have this greater freedom, not because private property is upheld, but because the freedom for the minority who owns private property is limited. The deeper freedom isn't compatible with a world in which a few own private property and the rest of us are at their mercies to survive. So I think this is a big mistake on Bhaskar's part because he's conflating the idea of security with the idea of freedom. And he uses the word freedom to describe security, but obviously it's possible to have security and not have freedom. Fundamentally, socialists believe in the rights of people to the fruits of their own labor. Many capitalists do contribute not only their individual talents, but managerial expertise to enterprises. And they often take on tremendous amounts of entrepreneurial risk in starting new ventures. The socialist argument is that in a different sort of system, workers can in fact elect management, run their own forums, bring new products and services to market without the need for capitalists. This is one of the critical parts of Bhaskar's arguments, and this is something that Epstein digs right into. You'll see in a minute that Epstein points out that this can already happen under capitalism. And he raises some good points, but I would take it a bit further. You see, even under capitalism, workers do own their own labor, but it's worthless to them, which is the exact reason that they sell it to a capitalist who can amplify its value and pay them many times more than they would be able to get paid if they kept the labor for themselves. 
This transaction of labor for money is voluntary and mutually beneficial to both buyer and seller. If you seized the means of production, you'd go back to your labor being next to worthless again because you don't have the capital, the knowledge in business, the connections, or the risk tolerance to create value. Because if you did, you wouldn't need socialism. You would just be a capitalist. Well, thanks. It's a uh, pleasure to debate this issue with Bhaskar Sankara. I've recognized not just that capitalism is more effective than socialism in making freedom possible. Under Bhaskar's socialism, the exercise of freedom would be impossible. But here's the good news. Capitalism makes it possible for Bhaskar to achieve socialism without tears. Each worker can draw the same wage if everybody chooses. All that's required is that you cover your costs, which can be done through many channels. His, quote, socialist vision requires, quote, abolishing private ownership of the things we all need and use, uh, factories, banks, offices, natural resources, utilities, communication and transportation infrastructure, and replacing it with social ownership, unquote. Under Bhaskar socialism, it would be unlawful to own factories, stores, and offices. Under capitalism, it would be unlawful for someone to take your factory, office, or store. For starters, while Bhaskar won't take our Kenny Loggins records, he will need to shut down the nearly 50 billion in financing raised every year through crowdfunding, which helps launch Kenny Loggins wannabes. He'll also need to outlaw the many other private ways people raise billions in funding to finance their ventures and be prepared to imprison those who defy the socialist law. Instead, economic decision-making would come under democratic control. So let's ask, how many Muslim prayer rugs would the democratic majority of workers vote to produce? What share of construction materials would a majority of workers apportion to new mosques? Right now, under capitalism, vegetarians and vegans, who together make up less than 10% of the population, have more options every year. Would the majority of workers find a need to produce vegan meat or milk substitutes? How important would worker majorities consider hair products for African Americans? So quite a long buildup, but some rock solid reasoning and very well spoken. I'll also just quickly mention that for the sake of time, I had to cut out a lot of rhetoric. For instance, he offers a very compelling argument that capitalism is not based off of profits. It's important to mention that because it does come up a little later, but it was just a little too verbose for this video. Bhaskar has written that he wants socialism to, quote, involve a commitment to a free civil society, especially for oppositional voices, unquote. Admirable statement there, Vas Bhaskar. But now imagine an oppositional voice like mine that wants the democratically elected planners to commit resources to put on public debates catering to libertarians who support capitalism. Or an oppositional voice that needs resources to publicize the idea that the planners themselves are corrupt. Will they really back those who seek to criticize them? Would Bhaskar really want to live in a society in which birth control is available if and only if a majority of workers votes for it? Or would he prefer a society in which private business can produce contraceptives, the preferences of a democratic majority be damned? These are some really great points, and it's worth noting that Bhaskar never actually addresses them throughout the entire debate. Under capitalism, the mere existence of buyers like Muslims, vegans, Orthodox Jews, and libertarians like me gives rise to suppliers of their needs. As a believer in freedom, Bhaskar might have noticed the intolerant strain in all societies, including this one. And yet he wants us all to take our chances with the potentially intolerant tyranny of the majority to which we must all respond, no in thunder. The right to private ownership of the means of production is essential to freedom. But without the right to private ownership, freedom doesn't stand a chance to begin with. 
realistically, that's because most of us will not have enough hours in the day or even any great desire to closely monitor the detailed decisions of the, of the democratically elected planning boards. The planners will have to deal with complex supply chains and must have the power to reallocate workers from co-ops that need to contract to others that need to expand. And here's why the planners will have a perfect excuse for rejecting projects they don't like. The economic reality of scarcity. By scarcity, I mean the fact that what everybody wants always adds up to more than there is. They can therefore reject projects they don't like on the factual grounds that the resources are simply not available. So, Baskar, let's talk about how workers, under your leadership, can cut out those middlemen and build socialism in the here and now by owning that private property. You could tap the power of the average consumer. The bottom half of income receivers in the US account for one third of all consumer spending and the bottom four fifths for nearly two thirds. Imagine that Baskar could assemble a minority accounting for just one fifth of consumer spending dedicated to patronizing firms run according to socialist values. Baskar has written that workers would reject employment by capitalists, quote, if given a fair alternative. Well, according to Vascar then, firms owned and operated by workers would provide that fair alternative. The profit margins of existing corporations average 15% of, of revenue. So the movement commands, so the, if the movement commands just 20% of the consumer dollar, it could target companies with boycotts, wipe out their profits, and acquire them on the cheap. Boycotting has an honorable tradition going back to Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi. And boycotts are free market acts performed by consenting adults by capitalist means. Instead, Baskar wants to play the ugly game of politics by trying to win voting majorities to impose socialism top down through government edict. My plan can happen much sooner, since a minority will be all that is needed to get the revolution going. We capitalists could not object, since it would not infringe on anyone's exercise of private property rights in capital goods. So those were the opening statements, and I think Gene did a really great job of being very thorough, explaining how a version of socialism can be accomplished through the capitalist markets. That discussion becomes central to the debate, as well as this idea that capitalism does not depend on profit necessarily, as you'll see in just a minute. Profit is the aim of all capitalists, and capitalism would not work if profit wasn't the aim of all capitalists. Once they're engaged in market competition, they need more money for expansion, they need money to guard against depreciation, they need money to develop. Uh, I find it quite, quite dubious that that, that basic point is, is now lost upon, upon libertarians. Uh, I basically uh, uh, believe that there should be a bedrock welfare state, something similar to what you have in Scandinavian social democracies. But then there, should, there has to be a, a, a sphere where there's market competition underway, where worker control firms are competing with each other um, and producing consumer products. Um, if you want to create a new firm, you'd be able to do so without recourse to private capital because there could be state-owned banks that are using objective measures uh, based on profitability and other, other factors, maybe also incorporating certain ecological factors, like ex cost of externalities, uh, to decide what to fund, what not to, to fund. But I see it as largely a technocratic and depoliticized uh, process. Uh, Bhaskar, depreciation is a cost. It, it, it's a, you, you don't make a profit by paying for your depreciation. We at the So Forum and Bhaskar at, uh, at Jacobin is bringing in new technology. He, he's actually planning a movie, he's planning a book. We're planning to expand and we don't make any profit, but obviously we raise revenue for that. So this idea of Baskar's that you need that you need profit. Profit, obviously, the profit and law system, I believe, is indeed highly productive, but it's a matter of choice under capitalism. If they need money to innovate or expand, they raise the money. If they need to pay for depreciation, as every capitalist must, they have to pay for that too. But they don't make any profit out of it. They just raise funds 
for those things. Vascar has told us we don't need crowdfunding. Okay, you don't know. You not only don't need it, Vascar. I assume it's going to be unlawful. I assume you're going to forcibly shut it down because it's evil. Because it raises money for people to own and operate private. Uh, capital. You want state-owned banks, and you said, hey, look, we have that. Well, you know what that is, Baska? That's the ugly thing we libertarians called crony capitalism, or I prefer to call it crapitalism. That's the rule by elites. I think that for example, when it comes to medical care, will we really have Medicare for all, or we, will we have the Veterans Administration for all? That wonderful government-run medical care system that's, been, that's turned into a charnel house of bureaucratic killing. Would you allow a firm to downsize severely, like cut one-third of its staff if it's having trouble competing? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, these, the, uh, uh, of course. I mean, the firms will need to be competitive in the market. The question is, what happens when you fail? Will it be utter destitution, or will you land into the arms of a welfare state? Gene misses the opportunity here to point out a contradiction in Baskar's argument. If firms in market socialism have to compete on price and quality, then that means that they suffer from the same pressures that firms in capitalism do. For example, firms that operate more efficiently will outproduce firms that operate inefficiently. Firms that have a hierarchical management structure will outperform firms that don't. Even Karl Marx describes this in the Communist Manifesto. And by the way, I might as well just mention that I am reading the Communist Manifesto right now, and I'm planning to do some videos on it in the future. The one right that is, uh, uh, very prevalent and it's a major feature of this society that I don't think would be given is the right to employ other people in wage labor. So if you want a criticism, it's, it's, it's on that. Um, in, a, in a normative sense, hierarchy and exploitation are bad and to whatever extent it can be mitigated, uh, we should um, mitigate it. Uh, but then in addition to that, there'll be, a political, there'll be representative democracy plus certain direct democratic inputs. Uh, so you'll be free to have the Soho Forum, you'll be free to, to fundraise for other things, as long from as- From whom? From the state-owned banks? From whom? You You're can, shutting down crowdfunding. Well, I, do I have well, to kiss the asses of the state-owned bankers, uh, the capitalist Baskar? You would allow crowdfunding? Yes, sure. And as then, long as it's not used to create an enterprise that employs wage labor. If somebody voluntarily wants to work for me at the SOA Forum, what happens? And insists on doing Does that person go to prison? So, if he continues to do that, to violate your rule, what happens then, Baskar? Capitalist acts between consent and control. Voluntary actions between people. You don't allow to allow those. You are a lover of freedom. You're doing double things. You hate freedom. People should not do voluntary acts. People want to work for me. They want to work for you. Don't you have employees, Beth? Aren't you a capitalist with employees? I'm posing a, simil a, a relationship in which this, this thing, wage labor, is no longer allowed. It's Don't you realize that. that you've backed away from my question? If somebody voluntarily wants to work for me for, for what I pay and under my and says I want to do it, you're going to throw that person in prison if that person does it against your wishes and values? Is that what you're going to do? How are you going to enforce your rules, Baskar? How is that going to happen? Well, I, I think that in a society in which most people can do similar labor to what you're describing, but actually be shareholders, actually own, own shares and receive dividends from a firm, I'm not sure they would choose to, to do that. Vascar keeps ducking the two questions, which is, why doesn't he create worker-owned firms if he doesn't like firms owned by a handful of people? That's quite possible under this capitalism. And would he actually throw in prison people who violate his values, who choose to work for, for, for capitalist firms voluntarily, even though, as I've said, his quasi-socialist alternative would be available. One is uh, worker-owned firms under capitalism are fine, but they're subjected to a lot of the same pressures, uh, com competitive pressures as, as, other, as other firms. On, on the second question, no, I don't, think, I don't think, I don't think uh, coercion uh, would, be, would be necessary. What if people voluntarily decide to work in conditions that you don't like, and they say, no, I want to do it? And then you say, well, you have to stop doing it. No, I can't stop doing it. If it's necessary, would you throw people in prison for violating your values? There'll be a, a judicial system that'll have certain criteria for when it throws people in prison. It'll, it'll have certain criteria for what speech is allowed and what's not. And it will probably draw on existing types of jurisprudence. So, for example, clear and present danger. 
You know, like, like it's not, it's not a, a leap into an unknown future. It's not a year zero break with, with the past. Um, we're saying that there are certain spheres of life that are right now only available to people who could pay, but should be available to everyone as part of their basic needs. We're saying that there are certain forms of exploitation and oppression that exist in the world today that we think we can construct a society where it doesn't exist. Gene nails it here, and this was a real magical moment for the debate. You see, by abolishing wage labor, you are not just harming employers, you are also harming the people who rely on the wage labor for their survival. You are harming the employees. This is a double-edged sword, and so what do you do if somebody really relies on that income, and as a consenting adult, they make the decision that they would like to work in exchange for some form of capital, right? So this would be like black market labor, and this exists even in our current economy. There's people who work for less than the minimum wage, and in our current society, we do persecute these people. Baskar's response is that this would never happen in socialism. But like, what of a naive thing to say? He's too much of an idealist and he's not looking at the reality of the world we live in. He's making the assumption that in socialism, you will have a complete utopia and wealth for everyone and that we'll never go into recession. But like, how does he know that? So I'm really glad that Gene did not let up on this. So uh, my name is Jenny Brown. Um, so I wonder if both the speakers could address the situations that we see on the shop floor in, for example, production companies in the US where it's no degrees of freedom, no choices about whether you can uh, have a work overtime, you have to or you will lose your job. You're given three minutes to urinate once a day. Sometimes you have to wear diapers on the line because you will be fired if you go the situation that is existing right now under capitalism with private ownership, if you could just address the, the working conditions that that is kicking up. And uh, what percentage of workers do you think work under those circumstances? It's about 20%. 20%. And do, you said, and that's uh, in fact uh, who, uh, who are you know, not allowed to urinate, know, yes. Do you, know, that, do, you know, that, do you know we only have 20% of the workers in factories to begin with, but 20%. No, not just factories. Some school teachers have to bring their whole class into the bathroom so that they can pee. Oh, right. So kind of a dumb question, but I got some value out of that. Obviously, the schools are not privately owned. For every uh, 30 kids in a class in New York, there's $600,000 that could be realized how much of it ends up in the classroom. Nationwide, there's $300,000 that could be realized. The schools are run by government bureaucracies. Uh, that we may want to free it up from government control. And that's the reason why poor people, poor people are, are oversubscribing the charter schools and the, and the voucher schools because they spend their money so that kids do not have to pee in the hall. Government control of, uh, on the behalf of special interests of, of, of so many professions is locked up. You know how difficult it is to become a plumber in New York be because of the, the state-supported plumbers union? All of those alternatives should work, should open up for laborers, but they are closed because unfortunately, people like Basco think that government control, all this credentialism and all these barriers that make it difficult for laborers to shop around to get better jobs, to, 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 to work under better working conditions, are closed off to them. So but with respect to the schools, what you should really fight, really do, is liberate all of that money so that the $300,000 average can get into that classroom and the kids could be peeing on gold-plated urinals with that <laughs> amount of money. So, so the, the, actual, the actual question was about the conditions of yeah. huge segments of American, uh, of American workers. And the simple reason why it's like that is because American unions are weaker than its counterparts anywhere else in the advanced capitalist world. The capitalist system, uh, the, the ways in which labor mobility is limited, which indeed it's also limited by unions, uh, and uh, the capitalist system whereby uh, profits are privatized and losses are socialized, the best example of that was Obama's bailout of General Motors and Chrysler, uh, again, socializing losses, which shafted auto workers in the South uh, and favored unions in Michigan because he was courting the Michigan vote. That's capitalism. And in the 
sports case, the, the capitalism uh, of, of government subsidizing sports stadiums for these very rich firms is, this, is an, obviously an outrage that Vascar should also oppose. Up until the 1950s, the teams paid for their own stadiums. Uh, the assertion is that it is competitive capitalism that is creating something, an externality called global warming. And global warming is threatening our very survival on this planet. Capitalism is responsible for this. That obviously you can have carbon taxes, you can rein it in. Uh, clearly, it's not, uh, it's not capitalism that causes global warming, it's industrialism. And uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Soviet Union was not capitalist, it was massively polluting. Uh, China, <laughs> China, excuse me? Competing with the United States, okay. So that's why they did it. Do you want to, you, are you saying that the use of fossil fuels only happens under capitalism, sir? Uh, no. No, oh good, okay, then no, no that's good. No, and then, oh, then you answered my question, then the use of fossil fuels is what's polluting, what's the, causing the, global warming, and, and so that's why. And why don't we get onto solar wind and geothermal energy? Why don't we do it? Because the coal, oil, and gas industry is stopping it from happening, and, which is own, who, who owns our government. And the market system will never get us out of this problem. All right. So that was a pretty emotional outburst, but the gentleman there does not explain why he thinks that the solution to corporations owning the government is to create more government. This is one of the problems I have with the alarmism surrounding the issue of climate change and global warming. People are just unable to think clearly or objectively about it. And I'm even starting to see a lot of rhetoric online by people who are calling for an authoritarian world government to come and control the means of production and stop global warming from happening. So that's kind of terrifying. Further reminder, the global warming science does not tell us that the world is going to end. It tells us that the world is going to change. So if you're a part of that alarmist crowd, take a deep breath and relax. Everything is going to be okay. Capitalist development has created mass abundance, but it hasn't met the needs of the most vulnerable. Millions still die every year of preventable diseases. Many more spend their lives mired in poverty. So those were in the closing remarks, and I'm not actually going to show any of the other closing remarks because a lot of it was just a repeat of other things that were talked about in the debate. My criticism of Bhaskar's closing remarks here is that he's implying that capitalism is the cause of people being impoverished, which um, is not supported by any data. In fact, the regions of the world that embrace the most capitalism and have the freest markets tend to be the least impoverished ones. And the countries that have the least capitalism tend to be the most impoverished ones. So that was a very half-baked and weaselly thing to say. One thing that I found surprising that Bhaskar didn't do is that he didn't go after libertarianism. Gene Epstein is a libertarian, and I think that Bhaskar probably could have thrown some pretty good jabs at him by talking about some of the controversial issues within libertarianism. If Bhaskar had done this, Gene would have to be very careful not to get distracted, which would have been a challenge because capitalism and libertarianism go hand in hand. But instead, he wastes all of his time time talking about this utopia fairy tale dream world where technocratic state socialism reigns and people work without getting paid. So I really don't think that Bhaskar is helping the socialist movement by acting this way. So who won the debate? Uh, you know, it doesn't matter. These things are all rigged. People will always manipulate the votes. But anyway, you have my opinion on it. Um, there's links in the video description if you want to go check out the debate and watch the full video. I know this video is almost half an hour long, but this is as short as I could get it while covering all the points. Anyway, thanks for watching. Bye bye. <laughs>